So good morning, Al. Good morning. Is this one on now? Do you hear me? Can okay, you hear me? let's test. Good. Okay. Um, let's begin more than at the beginning. Let's begin before you. Could you tell us a little bit about your parents, uh, their lives before the war? What's your family roots? Well, my parents were born in Eastern Europe, uh, a part of the world uh, that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, until the First World War. Uh, after the First World War, their hometowns, uh, Rimana for my mother and Kanchuga for my father, we incorporated, we became part of, of Poland. And uh, as uh, they were incorporated into Poland, there was an increase in anti-Semitism. Uh, there were also fewer opportunities for young Jewish people. So there was a tremendous pressure for them to leave their homes. And indeed, when they were about 18 years old, uh, my father went directly to Holland, to the Netherlands, where he started a men's clothing business. And my mother, uh, at her, when she reached the age of 18, uh, left home and joined her older siblings who were living in Berlin. Berlin was the big go-to city uh, for young people uh, wanting to explore a new world. So they went off in search of fewer anti-Jewish restrictions, economic opportunities. Um, how did they finally meet each other? Well, they had actually been uh, childhood sweethearts. They knew each other since, since early childhood. Uh, and so uh, at the end of 1932, um, after my father had established his business, my mother left Germany, left Berlin, uh, and she joined my father. And that's where they were married at the very end of 1932, which parenthetically is just about the same time that Adolf Hitler became chancellor or prime minister of Germany, really starting the whole Nazi era. I think it's um, very important that you mention that um, coincidence of timing, because it reminds us that history is not preordained, people don't know what's happening, and your parents were just newlyweds starting a new life together. Yeah, and in Holland, really, there, had, there was no anti-Semitism. Uh, Jews that lived in Holland for hundreds of years uh, were part of all segments of society, the arts, business, uh, government. And uh, so my parents made many, many friends, uh, most of them not Jewish, actually. You know, they were, they were sort of rebelling against the uh, very strict Jewish Orthodox upbringing from the small towns that they came from in, in Poland. Uh, and we're exploring, really, uh, new friendships, new relationships with other people. You mentioned that your father uh, started a men's clothing business. Isn't there still a sign? Tell us something you discovered yes. there. So. Uh, so a few years ago, we were in Holland and went to pass by the house where I was born, actually. I was born in the upper story. And downstairs was my father's business and the sign of my father's store, my father's business, is still there. Uh, a little white lie, sort of, it says Siegfried Munzer, and I assumed this, this fancy Germanic name, Siegfried, and it says Taylor from Vienna. It wasn't quite from Vienna, but you know, close enough, <laughs> the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that beautiful sign, which was probably, probably designed by my mother because she was an artist, uh, is still there. Hmm. Uh, so when were your sisters born? Well, my, my, as I said, my father's business flourished, and so in July 1936, uh, my parents celebrated the birth of their first child, and that was my sister, uh, Eva. July 1936, just another coincidence, of course, is just about the same time that the infamous Berlin Olympics were held, which Adolf Hitler turned into an instrument of Nazi propaganda. So another very happy occasion in, in Holland, birth of their first child, while only a few hundred miles away, the Nazi era was progressing uh, and was spreading. And then uh, two years later, uh, in November 1938, uh, is when they celebrated the birth of their second child, uh, my sister, Leah, and there you have another coincidence because she was born 
three days after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when uh, in Germany the full fury of anti-Semitism was unleashed and hundreds of synagogues were destroyed, thousands of Jewish businesses were plundered, really a major, major turning point uh, in the continuing development of the Nazi era. And again, was a happy occasion uh, in Holland, the birth of my parents' second child. But even then, actually, many of the relatives who had been able to come earlier to visit were no longer able to join them uh, and celebrate with them. I have to say I'm enjoying hearing babies babbling while we're talking about right. babies. Yes. Um, it's, uh, that's not staged. So. Um, so already in terms of relationships with long distance relatives, you're feeling restrictions. And then of course, on September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland, uh, starting the Second World War. Um, the following May, when Holland is attacked, along with Belgium and Luxembourg, tell us what that meant in terms of life for your parents and other Jews living in Holland. Well, what my mother told me uh, was that uh, on the eve of the invasion of Holland, my parents had been asked to uh, host a man who was a member of the Dutch resistance movement. And supposedly he had plans with him in a briefcase to preemptively destroy the big railroad center in the city of Utrecht. It was felt by the resistance movement that destroying that big railroad center might slow down any invasion coming from Germany. But that morning, uh, May 10th, 1940, my parents and their guest listened to the radio and they heard that the port city of Rotterdam had been bombed and that Holland had been invaded. And shortly after that, uh, my parents and their guest heard Queen Wilhelm Nina of the Netherlands come on the radio and announce that Holland had surrendered. And she told pe people to continue to do their duty wherever they happened to find themselves. Those are her exact words. And the first person to speak up was actually my parents' guest, this man from the resistance movement. Uh, and he said in Dutch, God dank, it is ten einde. Thank God, it's over. Uh, as far as he was concerned, he had been part of the resistance movement and he had done what he could to slow down any invasion and now he would have to accommodate and live under an occupation. But my parents, looking at their little kids, knew what had happened in Germany, what had happened in Poland, and knew that they were going to be in for a very, very rough time. They were aware of all the restrictions that had been placed on Jews, all the humiliations that Jews had been subjected to in Germany and in Poland, and knew that things were going to get very rough. And indeed, within a very short period of time, all sorts of restrictions were placed on Jews in Holland. Uh, the first thing was the prohibition on uh, the slaughter, kosher slaughter of animals, uh, ritual slaughter of animals for kosher meat, uh, which some people might think, well, that's fairly benign, that's not very serious. But then Jewish men had to take a new middle name, Israel, Jewish women, a new middle name, Sarah, so they could always be identified as being Jewish. They had to register their properties so that it would be easier ultimately uh, to Conf 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 confis confiscate you know, the property. And then finally, Jews were even prohibited from using public transportation or from going into public parks. And um, that brings up a story that my mother told me. You know, when you have a crazy prohibition, like not being allowed to go into a public park, you know, you tend to ignore it. And so my mother did, she continued to take my little sister, uh, Leah, in a baby carriage uh, into a neighboring park. And one day, my mother told me, a German woman approached the baby carriage and my mother's heart almost stopped because she knew she wasn't supposed to be there. 
But then the woman smiled, started playing with my sister's blonde curls, looked at her blue eyes, and she turned to my mother and she said, ah, you can tell that this is good German Aryan blood. You know, part of this whole crazy, crazy racist ideology of Adolf Hitler. Of course, my mother thanked the woman, left the park, and never went back there again. Yeah, uh, you must have really shaken her. Absolutely, yes. Now, shortly before you were born, if I'm remembering correctly, your parents enrolled your oldest sister in a Catholic school, am I right? Yes, it's a little bit unclear as to whether they, what the timing was when they were enrolled in a Catholic school. Uh, it may have coincided with my sister's going into hiding, actually. Okay. Which was a little bit later. All right, so let's get to that in a minute. But first, I would like you, to, baby you, to come into sure. the scene. Uh, so you're born November 23rd, 1941. So this is almost 19 months after the German occupation of Holland. Um, what a complicated time to have a new Jewish baby born. Tell us a little about what that was like for your parents. Well, my mother told me that this was an unplanned pregnancy and she consulted her obstetrician and he told her in no uncertain terms to have an abortion. He told her that it would be immoral to bring another Jewish life into the world. Now, my mother at that time wasn't especially religious uh, but she turned to the Bible for advice and she told me that she read the story of Hannah, a woman who was desperate to have a child and would go to the temple every year and pray that she might conceive. And it was in reading of Hannah's agonizing desire to have a child that my mother decided she could not possibly have an abortion. Uh, her obstetrician fired her and so November 23rd, 1941, uh, I was born at home with the help of a nurse. And your parents then made a kind of audacious decision. Right, because there was, this brought about another dilemma in, in Jewish life, because traditionally Jewish male children are circumcised uh, when they are eight days old. It's, it's a tradition that goes all the way back uh, to biblical times. And my parents' friends said, don't have him circumcised because it will identify him as being Jewish. But this time the answer to my parents' dilemma came in the form of a worried look on the face of a pediatrician who had just examined me. And my father asked him, is there something wrong with the baby? And then the pediatrician smiled and said, no, there's nothing wrong, it's just that your little boy needs a minor operation we call a circumcision. And so my father told him of our Jewish tradition, and in day, indeed, eight days later, the family gathered in our living room to observe this first milestone uh, in a Jewish life. And it's probably the last time that such an observance occurred in occupied Holland. And what's very special about the event is that there were some photographs taken. Uh, and uh, they were very small, actually. One by one and a half inch in size. I've seen these photographs. And what made these photographs very special is that my mother was to keep those two little photographs of my circumcision ceremony hidden on her body through her stay subsequently in 12 concentration camps. And she had this superstition, this feeling that if she ever lost these photographs, it would mean uh, that I had been killed. Fortunately, I survived, the photographs survived, my mother survived. And the photographs, of course, are so valuable, so fragile that I did not want to keep them in the house. And they are now part of the collection of this museum. And it's our sacred duty and honor to preserve those. Um, yeah. So over the next 10 months after your birth, let's fast forward to September 1942, conditions had become far worse uh, in the Netherlands generally and especially for Jews and your parents decided that your family must go into hiding uh, for safety. What convinced them and what arrangements did they make? Well, this is when uh, Jewish men were beginning to get notices to report 
for so-called labor duty, which meant being sent to a concentration camp initially in Holland, but knowing full well that there was a very good chance that they might be sent much further east, you know, to concentration camps uh, in Poland. And so this was really a signal to, to many Jews in Holland to, to hide, to find a hiding place. And so the first two to be placed in hiding, well, actually my father was the first one to go into hiding. Uh, he pretended to commit an act of suicide <clears throat> and that gained him admission to a psychiatric hospital. Then the next two to be placed were my two sisters. Uh, a very devout Catholic woman told her priest that she had a dream in which the Virgin told her to take Jewish children into hiding. She, the priest told my parents, neighbors, the neighbors told my parents, and so my two sisters were entrusted you know, to this very devout Catholic woman, and that's when they really adopted their Catholic uh, identity. And that left my mother home alone uh, with me. And my mother told me that that was one of the most frightening times in her life because she was so afraid that one, some Nazi soldier or policeman might come knocking on the door or would ring the doorbell. And so my mother took a piece of cloth and wrapped it around the clapper of the doorbell so that she wouldn't be aroused by that sound. And then she told me she spent the entire night watching the clapper to see whether it moved. That's how anxious she was. Uh, Jewish male children were more difficult to place, but finally uh, a neighbor uh, by the name of Annie Matna agreed uh, to take me in. And that's how I ended up you know, with the Matna family. Uh, Annie Matna had had some bad run-ins with the Nazis, and so she passed me on first to her sister. Her sister's name is Yorina. It's something I only found out in the last few weeks, actually. Oh, really? Uh, I met Yorina's daughter, who still lives in Holland in The Hague, and she told me about the three weeks that I spent with the Polak family. Uh, Annie Matna's sister. Uh, she said, I slept in their parents' bed between the two of them, uh, but that I was very unhappy, crying all the time, and that they had a Nazi neighbor, or a member of the Dutch Nazi party, rather, and were so afraid that he might hear a strange baby. And so that's why I was passed back to Annie, who then finally, uh, after these three weeks, passed me on to her former husband, Tole Matna. So you can see that the story is still unfolding. I'm still finding out things about my early life. And that's how I ended up with Tole Matna. Before we go on to talk about the Madnas, I want to be sure that the audience has followed that for Jews who were lucky enough to find a way to hide in Nazi-occupied Europe, there were two ways to hide. One is to literally be physically hidden, which is what happens to baby Al. And then the other is to hide in plain sight under an assumed identity. And that's what happened to your sisters. When you Correct. say yes. they assumed a Catholic identity, they were not physically hidden, but they were presenting themselves as the daughters of this devout woman. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, this was also another decision that my parents had to make was, you know, some families went into hiding as one family unit, like the famous Anne Frank family, right? They were all hidden in that one attic. My parents decided that is a form of insurance so that if one member of the family was discovered, at least the others would have a chance to survive, we would be hidden in different places. Uh, and so that's why I ended up in one place, my sisters uh, in another. Uh, after I was placed with Annie Madden, that's when my mother joined my father in the same psychiatric hospital where he was, but in her case, are pretending to be a nurse's assistant. And that's where they remained for several months, actually. I'd also like us to try to imagine, especially those of us in the room who are parents, 
the leap of faith and the profound terror that it must have been for your parents because they did not know the people who are caring for their children and they could not visit, they couldn't check in and get information. You just sort of disappear into this void in a way, right? Actually, my, uh, my parents were allowed to saw my sisters one last time. One time. One more time, and that was Christmas Day, uh, 1942. Uh, they, my two sisters were brought to the hospital to visit my parents, and that's the very last time that our family came together. Uh, because shortly after that, actually, just a week later, uh, New Year's Day, 1943, the psychiatric hospital was emptied of all patients and staff, and they were all sent to concentration camps, uh, to Westerbork, specifically in Holland, and then on to other camps in Holland. And that's also a reminder that among uh, the targets of Nazi persecution were not only Jews, but also people with mental and physical exactly. disabilities. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned now you have been passed through networks of trust, uh, a baby, to this man, Tole Madna. And for context, uh, Tole Madna was an immigrant from Indonesia. Indonesia was a Dutch colony. Um, so tell us a bit about Tole Madna. Sure. Who was this person? What was your life like there? Sure. So Toli uh, Madna and Annie Madna had been married, but uh, they, they were divorced. They had three children of their own, uh, and they now joined those three children in the family, uh, Will, uh, Devi, and Rob Madna were the three children. Uh, Toli Madna had come to Holland in the early 1900s uh, with his mother, and his mother could not stand the cold Dutch climate. So she went back to Indonesia and he stayed behind uh, and was kind of adopted by a Dutch family uh, and ended up uh, becoming the manager of an Indonesian restaurant uh, in The Hague. And uh, there was a young woman from Indonesia working in that restaurant by the name of Mina Saina and uh, he really got to like her, and uh, he thought she was very gentle and kind, and so he hired her as a nanny uh, for his three children. And that's how Mima Saina came to join the Madna family. Uh, Mima was also born in Indonesia, as I said before, but she was completely illiterate, came from a very, very poor background, uh, could not read or write, did not speak the Dutch language, only the Indonesian language, which is now called Bahasa. Uh, and, uh, but she had a heart of gold. And it's this woman who now really became my mother. Um, you know, she had to walk miles every day just to get milk for me because I was in the house, in the household, completely illegally, and everything was strictly rationed, and you had to have coupons to get any kind of food. So even just to get milk for me, she had to scrounge around and walk miles every day to get food. Uh, actually, a few years ago, when I was in Holland, uh, a woman approached me and wagged her finger at me, and she said, you know, you used to drink my milk. So I asked her, I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, all school children in Holland were given a small bottle of milk during the war years. And my mother told me to save half that little bottle for the baby next door. And you were the baby next door. And so here you have it, you know, a little kid, perhaps eight, nine or 10 years old, already being taught to save human life. Uh, one of the more beautiful stories that comes out of this, this horrible period, you know, in fact, the memories that I have of being with the Matna family are all very happy ones. Uh, I do want to ask because the fact that this child was aware that there was a baby being hidden, even if you're hidden, there are people with knowledge which increases risk. Um, and in addition to the fact that you are a baby who should not be there, we saw from the photograph, 
you are a white-skinned blonde baby living with a brown-skinned family. There is no possible illusion that you are their child. True. Um, how was your presence explained to anyone? And talk about well, what first, your life was. First of all, you know, I was not allowed out of the house at all. For how long? Uh, almost the entire the three years that I was with the Madna family. So three years you are inside a house. Inside the house. Yeah. I wasn't even allowed to come near a window for fear that people on the outside might see a child looking very, very different from the other children uh, in the Madna household. So the only view that I had of the outside world was what I could see through a mail slot in the door. That was my total view of the outside world. Uh, there were a few exceptions. There were a few people in the Indonesian community uh, who were trusted uh, and who knew about my presence. Uh, and then you saw a photograph earlier uh, of two little kids who were allowed to come into the house and play with me. They were actually German, uh, who had Germans who had moved to Holland, and, uh, but they were trusted because they were socialists or communists. And so their families were trusted you know, to be very strongly anti-Hitler, anti-Nazi, and they were allowed to come into the house and play with me. That was the one exception. The only difficult, the only painful memory that I have of being with the Mata family occurred very, very late, actually, in my stay. Uh, and that's when I was very, very hungry because there was very, very little food during the last winter of the war years. And uh, the only thing that we had left to eat really was uh, tulip bulbs, which people ground up into sort of a mush. And I remember being very hungry one evening, seeing the table set and sitting down at the table, expecting to be fed, and then falling asleep with my head falling in the plate. And that's how the family found me the following morning. But that's the only, you know, bad memory that I have. There were times when the house was searched. I wasn't aware of that, but I was told to go hide in the closet. And, but there I remember, again, one of the very few clear memories I had. I remember playing with the Christmas decorations that the family kept in the closet. And so again, you know, something that could be very painful turned into a happy memory. Now, your sisters uh, were hidden with a Catholic woman. Mima Saina was Muslim, right? Mima Saina was Muslim with a very heavy Buddhist influence, which is very common uh, in Indonesia. And she was so protective of you and aware of this constant mortal risk. Tell us about how she would sleep. I slept in Mima's bed, I'm told, and she kept a knife under her pillow vowing to kill any Nazi who might try to come and get me. Uh, and that's how so protective you know, she was of me. Um, many, many years later, when I was reunited with my mother, uh, my mother tried to uh, persuade Mima to go see a movie. She wanted to have some time alone with me. So she sent me, gave me my, a ticket to go see a movie, which was a novelty immediately after the war. And after a few minutes, Mima came back into the house and she put her finger at my mother and she said, don't hit him. Because that's how protective she was of me that she did not even trust my own mother to take care of me. Uh, your sisters, unfortunately, were not so fortunate. Tell us what happened to them. Well, sadly, the husband of the family where my two sisters were hidden denounced his wife to the Nazis as hiding two Jewish children. His wife was put in prison, eventually freed, but my two sisters were immediately taken to a prison in Scheveningen, which is the beach resort near The Hague. And then almost immediately from there, we're taken to Westerbork concentration camp, and then taken from there very quickly to Auschwitz, where they were killed. February 11th, 1944, 75 years ago. So I never knew my sisters. And it's, it's one of the 
terrible losses that I suffered, that my mother suffered, is that they did not survive while I did. And I think also uh, the story of how they came to be murdered is a reminder to us that not everything that happened during the Holocaust was directed by ideology. This was a man who was in a fit of rage against his wife. Exactly. And your children were the innocent. Yeah, we, we don't know exactly. Part. It's only very recently that I found out the name of the family that my sisters were hidden, uh, or and, and the location of their house. So I'm still finding things out. People have asked me very frequently whether this man was ever punished, and I have absolutely no idea whether he ever was prosecuted. Uh, but it's because of his fit of rage or because he belonged to the Nazi party in Holland that my sisters were killed. That my, I was deprived of the companionship of two sisters and my mother was deprived of her two daughters. And how is it that you know with precision the date and place of their deaths? Well, there is the very, one of the things that the Nazis did was keep very, very precise records. And uh, we, my mother, received documents from what's now called the International Trade Tracing Service through the International Red Cross, actually, documents that showed exactly when my sisters were killed. And uh, we got those documents sometime in the 1940s after the war. So if you can, um, briefly tell us then what happened to your mother, what happened to your father? Well, my parents uh, were taken first to Westerbork, uh, which was a major transit camp in Holland. And then they were sent on to uh, Fucht, another concentration camp, where they worked for the Philips Electronics Factory, did slave labor for Philips Electronics. And uh, my mother told me that uh, while she was working at the Philips factory, uh, one morning there would be a lineup of all the prisoners every morning, and one day they were addressed by a very high Nazi official, Heinrich Himmler, Hitler's second in command, and he exhorted the prisoners to keep working for the success of the Reich. He said, as long as you keep doing that, nothing bad will ever happen uh, to, to you. Uh, my mother told me about one of the interesting things is that while he was speaking, she spotted the spire of a small Dutch church way off in the distance. Uh, and she said it would be so wonderful if peace were to break out at that moment and she could run to that church, fall on her knees, and thank God for having been freed. She didn't care whether it was a church, a mosque, or a synagogue, just a place where she could think, thank God for having been freed. But that wasn't to be. Himmler did not keep his promise. Uh, and three months later, my father was taken from Furcht to Auschwitz. And something that I only found out in the last few days, actually, that my mother remained uh, in Furcht in that concentration camp for another three months. And then finally, in June 1944, is when she and a whole group of about 400 women were the last ones sent from Furcht to Auschwitz. And then from, Furcht, from Auschwitz, she was sent on to another electronics factory in a place called Reichenbach. And that was the Telefunken of now Siemens factory, uh, where she continued to do the work she had been doing at Philips, which was assembling radio tubes. She had found out through the grapevine that this was a, a something essential for the German war effort, effort and might be you know, her ticket uh, to survival. And she continued to do that. And she told me that working in that factory uh, gave her a spirit of defiance or of hope because she worked alongside German soldiers who had been repatriated, sent from the Eastern Front from Russia because they had been severely injured. And they had become so anti-Nazi that they did everything possible to sabotage the workings of the factory. So it encouraged my mother to engage in her own little acts of sabotage. And she would have told me she, she would 
spend a whole day assembling a radio tube, then at the end of the day, when the siren was sounded, she would disassemble the radio tube, put the parts back in the drawer, and start the process all over again the following day. And that, that's the kind of act, I think, that, that really is kind of act of defiance that I think kept my mother alive. And she then witnessed the bombing uh, of the Telefunken factory by the Allies. And as she saw the factory going up in flames, she told me she, she said the Hebrew play, prayer of thanks to God for having survived to see that particular day. It wasn't the end of her ordeal because she was then put on a whole series of what were subsequently called death marches, very well described by Eli Wiesel in his book Night. And fortunately, she survived those death marches. Actually, some of them were actual marches, and some of them were being transported in cattle cars. My mother told me that while she was in one of those cattle cars, she was able to look out through a crack and saw the emergence of spring. And it again gave her hope. And she said, you know, when this all ends, we're not gonna have much money, but this may not be a bad way to travel and to see the beautiful countryside. Again, you know, finding hope while you're being confined with 100 other people in a cattle car. I think it's the kind of thing that kept my mother alive. Eventually, she was freed at the Danish border uh, through the intervention of the Sweden, head of the Swedish Red Cross and then crossed into Sweden, crossed from Denmark to Sweden, where she then spent three months recuperating until she was finally reunited with me. Tell us about that reunion. That was the very, that's the very first clear memory, very clear memory that I have. I remember being asleep in one of the back rooms of the Madna house, and my foster sister, Devi Madna, coming to get me and carry me into the living room where the whole family was sitting in the circle. And I was unhappy about being awakened. And so they did what you do with a cranky, crying child. You pass it from one lap to the next. And what I remember was that there was one lap I refused to sit in. One woman I kept pushing away. And that, of course, was my own mother because she was a complete stranger to me. I already had a mother and that was Mima Saina. And so, of course, my mother realized that it would take time for me to get used to being with her. And so she felt that Mima ought to continue to care for me while she, my mother, went out looking for work. Sadly, uh, that only lasted for about three months because in October 1945, Mima Saina had a cerebral hemorrhage and passed away. And I have almost no memories of Mima Saina. Um, I do remember visiting her grave many times, so much so that when I went back to Holland many years later, and went to, to visit the cemetery where she was buried with Papa Madna, with Tole Madna, I was immediately able to find her gravesite because I'd been there so many times before. The only other memory that I have of her uh, came to mind uh, many, many years later here at the museum when I spoke to a group of students visiting the museum from Indonesia. And I told them the whole story of my family. And at the very end, I said, you know, I have very few memories of that period and of Mima, but I do remember that she used to sing a lullaby to me, and it was called Nina Bobo. And this entire group of students from Indonesia started singing the lullaby in perfect unison. It was one of the most beautiful, most moving moments I've ever experienced. And it shows, you know, again, the power of telling the story 
to people who are totally unfamiliar with it. You know, young women after that in headscarves, very traditional Muslim women approached me and said, you know, we are family. And that realization that we're all one human family, I think is something very, very important to me. When your mother returned to the Netherlands, uh, after all she'd been through, she did not know if you were alive or dead. She didn't know about her two daughters, her husband. How did she find out what had happened to your sisters? I'm not exactly sure when she found out. One of the things that I, I learned very recently is that when my mother came to the house, to Annie Matna's house actually looking for me, uh, it was Devi Matna, who's now alive and who's now 91 years old, who answered the door. Mm. And I think it felt to her to tell her that my sisters were no longer there. You know, this 14-year-old girl having to tell my mother that. I think that's when my mother first found out. Now, I haven't told you yet what happened to my, my father, how she found out. I think she found out fairly soon that my father did not survive, but the details came up much later again when she got documents from the International Tracing Service, from the Red Cross. And it, it showed uh, that he had remained in Auschwitz for about six months, then was sent on to another concentration camp in, Aust in Austria, actually, called Mauthausen, a whole hellhole of a camp where the prisoners were forced, forced to call, carry boulders, 46 pounds, up a ramp and very often would be tripped, so much so that 100,000 people actually died in that camp in that fashion. Survived that and then went on to three more camps, all in Austria, Gusen, Steyr, and then finally a place called Ebensee. Ebensee is a place high in the Austrian Alps, a uh, beautiful place. It's where the film Sound of Music was actually made. And in that beautiful place, there was a terrible, terrible concentration camp where the prisoners worked in underground abandoned salt mines assembling V2 rockets for the German army. Terrible work, never being allowed to see sunlight, almost no food, and so they were really in terrible, terrible condition when they were liberated by the U.S. Army. My father did survive to see liberation by the U.S. Army uh, in May 1945, but he was so weak that he died two months later, and he's buried in that concentration camp, which is now just one huge cemetery. <sighs> cemetery where Prisoners of all religions, all nationalities are buried, not just Jewish prisoners. So I never got to know my sisters, never got to know my father. And the only time that I really was able to feel the loss of my father is many years later, just before my mother and I came to the United States in 1958, when she felt it was important for us to visit his grave in Ebensee and it was standing at his grave that for the very first time, I started to cry and actually shed tears for my father. It's when the intensity of my loss really hit home. You brought something with you today, did you not? Yeah, there are very few physical memories of my father that I have and one of the prized possessions that I have is this pen, which was actually a Parker pen, which was a gift from my mother to my father. And usually when I come to the museum and sign documents here at the museum, uh, like a release for this interview today, usually I use this, this particular pen. And of course, you know, whenever I had a difficult, an exam or something like that, my mother always told me to take this pen with me uh, as a token, a good luck charm which I did, and I think it got me through high school, got me through college, got me through medical school, and that's how I became a doctor. I'm sure your father would be proud of the man you have become. I can't help but think of where we started, and in a moment we'll open to your questions, um, with that lovely wedding portrait of your parents. 
a young couple full of hope, building a family, and that only uh, two of you live to, to tell. Um, the last couple of questions I want to ask you. Um, tell us about an incident at the movies that happened to you and your mother, if you don't mind, in Holland, uh, not long after the war. Sure. Well, one of the saddest points about the Holocaust is that it, it not, did not erase anti-Semitism. And uh, that hit home immediately after the war, when my mother and I, short, you know, were standing in line to go to a movie. And uh, there was a man standing behind us, and he saw my mother's tattoo from Auschwitz. And he said in Dutch, there is one they did not get. Just showing that, that anti-Semitism persisted in Holland even after the war. After that, my mother always wore three-quarter length sleeves for the rest of her life because she did not want anyone to see that number. I think at this point we should open up to questions from the audience. Um, we have microphones that are circulating. We ask if you please wait for the microphone, not only so everyone can hear your question, but for those who later watch this uh, recording on YouTube or elsewhere, they will be able to hear. Uh, if you can raise your hand, and then we will bring a microphone. Uh, uh, mic mics are in the aisles. Ah, sorry, they are not brought. They are here. I can't see because of the bright lights. They are here, actually, on stands. Thank you. If you will approach the microphone, uh, that's how you could ask a question of Al. Um, just come up, please, sir, here. and. Uh, I'm sure Al will be happy to answer your question. And there's one in this aisle, too. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much for sharing. Uh, what kind of suggestion do you have for our students who are here uh, from all over the country uh, for their futures and for their? What suggestions do I have for students who are here, young people who are here? You know, there's what the Holocaust shows the tremendous danger of hatred, of prejudice. That hatred and prejudice can actually lead to murder. And hate and prejudice even begins in high school. It begins with bullying, and which sadly is very, very common in, in our schools. And so I always tell students that that's the first thing that they can do <laughs> is to stand up when their friends are being bullied, and then stand up to hate. Just like the Madna family, you know, they were surrounded by evil, and yet they stood up and did what is right. And they were themselves a marginalized group in their <coughs> society. They weren't in a place of exactly. security, were they? Exactly. I'm not quite sure why the, Indonesian, why the Indonesian community was never targeted specifically by the Nazis. They were preoccupied with other groups. Uh, and, you know, they were going by their own book, if you will, so they were never prosec pr persecuted. Thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. it. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. You spoke about how you, your mother saved the photographs of you as a baby, and I was just wondering about the pen that you have with you now, how that was saved through, uh, and where it was hidden, and how something so valuable survived. Fortunately, uh, many of our personal possessions were saved uh, by our neighbors. <clears throat> And so I have you know, hundreds of photographs, for example, of the family. Uh, I often tell people uh, that I have a family living in a box because that's how I learned the story of my family is by going through this box of photographs with my mother and her telling me stories about my father, my sisters, uh, my grandparents, whom I never knew either, obviously, they were, they were also killed by the Nazis. Uh, I have no, the only living relative really was one brother of my mother's who managed uh, to leave Germany uh, and end up in Bolivia, uh, one of the very few countries that was willing to take in Jewish refugees. And so he was the only, his, he and his son were the only relatives that I really knew after the war. Yes, ma'am. I have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first is you've mentioned a few times how you've just recently come across new information 
about your childhood and the people who cared for you. Um, can you share a little bit about how you're, you are continuing to, to find that information? And then my second question is, could you share a little bit about how all those early years have kind of carried with you into adulthood and, and shaped sure. your later life? Well, for many years, immediately after the Holocaust, there was reluctance for people to speak about what happened. Uh, I did, you know, and sort of I'm, I'm, I'm answering both questions at the same time. Uh, immediately after the war, for example, I had no understanding of what had happened to my sisters. Uh, you know, people, my mother's neighbors would show me notebooks where my sister Eva had been writing just perfect handwriting, uh, much better than I would ever have. And so, and she, they would tell me wonderful stories about my sister Leah. And so I actually grew up being jealous of my two sisters. And I had no understanding initially what had happened to them. And then I began to hear people say that such and such a person came back and such and such a person did not come back. And that's when I became to understand, came to understand that my sisters had gone somewhere, been taken somewhere, and did not come back. And then I gradually came to understand that they had been killed. And that's really when I started developing the whole story, sitting down with my mother, with the photographs. And then after the television series in the US called Holocaust, that's when I sat down with my mother with a big map and asked her exactly to tell me where she was at what time. I felt it was really important for me to document, to find out, to tell the story of what had happened to her uh, and the family. And that's how I gradually came to develop the story, came to understand what had happened to my family. Yes. A bit tall, so. Uh, so it, I've heard correctly, you have a husband, correct? If you have a husband. Yes. Okay, so I was wondering, you mentioned how anti-Semitism kind of lasted after the war, and I was wondering if you have any stories of, as you were exploring your homosexuality, how did that, um, did you have any incidents where, um, you know, someone who was obviously against that had, I don't know, kind of discriminated against against you, had any, just any incidents like that as you were exploring that, or if not, then no. No, I was fortunate uh, that I did not experience any kind of discrimination in that fashion. Uh, you know, it took me a long time to, to come to understand my own uh, sexuality as a child. Uh, you know, when I was young, I, am, I knew that my family had been lost during the Holocaust. Uh, I felt it was important to have a big family, to have 12 kids. And then very soon I came to realize, gradually came to realize that that wasn't to be uh, in my case. And I was fortunate eventually, you know, to, to come to understand myself. And for my mother especially, not just to accept me, but also to accept Joel, my husband. And uh, because my mother, I think, knew the dangers of hate. She had experienced it. And so this was another form, homophobia was another form of hate. And uh, my mother, to her credit, felt that that had no place in human society either. If I could add also as a historian, one of the things that uh, I think makes this history so powerful is the way that it connects with people from many different walks of life. Because what we see in Nazi Germany is an ideology that defines only one uniform way of being part of that community. And whether they were targeting gay men, or Jews, or Roma, or Jehovah's Witnesses, anyone who was defined as out of the group was suspect and even dangerous. And so I see this not as a German story, not as a Jewish story, but as a human story. And when Al is talking about how even just in the last few days, he's still learning new information about what happened to his family. 
Um, I think of our collections, and you are here in this museum, you come to a museum to see authentic artifacts. I think of our collections as really a gigantic forensic crime lab, evidence of one of the largest crimes ever committed, and we are on a daily basis finding new information. This is not settled history about which we know everything, and in a time when unfortunately we see rises in hatred, in anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and in denial of the Holocaust as eyewitnesses to this event die, the evidence becomes even more important and our work feels even more urgent. Uh, so I am neither surprised that you are finding new things, but it also makes me anxious because it means we have so much work to do and always new stuff and my colleagues and I are too busy. Uh, so um, it is uh, exciting and daunting. Final question, yes, please. Okay. Um, I was curious um, when you started volunteering here at the museum and how they came about, and has volunteering here been somewhat of a healing process for you? Yes, volunteering here, here at the museum really has been part of a healing process, and, and more than that, really. Uh, I believe that the museum plays a really key role in making sure not only that we remember the Holocaust, but that we learn the lessons of the Holocaust. You know, the saddest part about the Holocaust is while the world said never again, it did not put an end to hatred or prejudice. And so learning the lessons here, teaching the lessons here at the museum is extremely important. And when I see thousands of school kids coming through the doors of the museum day after day, learning the lessons, learning the dangers of hate. Uh, I think that has a profound healing effect uh, personally. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit easier for me to bear the loss of my father and the loss of my sisters. I would also like to thank you, Al. This is not easy. Um, these are not easy memories and issues to talk about. It's intimate. I can tell you that uh, my late father was a Holocaust survivor who never would talk in this setting, didn't even like to talk to his children. And I understand that. Uh, so we should not take for granted that uh, people do these programs. I mentioned earlier we will be having them every Wednesday and Thursday through August. So if you are local or if you have friends coming to town, please encourage them. Look on our YouTube channel. Um, look online. I see we have one more question. We'll take it briefly and then Al will uh, close our program. Yes, please. Thank you. I was just curious how you feel about your Jewish identity and, and how this whole thing that you went through influenced your, um, either your or like pride or if you're ashamed or, or how going through this influenced your um, relationship to your religion. Well, I'm very proud of my Jewish identity. Uh, and uh, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm practicing uh, Jew and religion, I practice my religion. I hold it very dear. Uh, and now I told you earlier that my mother, you know, before the war, my parents were sort of exploring, they were rebelling. After the war, my mother became much more observant and much more committed to her Jewish identity. Uh, and she made sure that I attended a Jewish primary school uh, and that I learned also one of the very first things that she, she asked me to learn was to say Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish that traditionally is said on the anniversary of the death of a relative for my father. And that's those are the first words of Hebrew that I learned is when I went to the synagogue to say Kaddish for my father. Uh, after the program, Al will be upstairs in the lobby here. If you think of another question, he'll be uh, signing volumes of our Echoes of Memory, which are uh, books of essays written by survivor volunteers here at the museum. Uh, I happen to know from experience he's not shy to pose for a picture if you want a selfie. Um, and uh, with that, uh, it's our tradition here at First Person that the first person guest has the last word. I think the most important lesson to me that I want to leave you with it's the Madna family. You know, the, the story of the Holocaust is horrible. But within the, the Holocaust, within the story of the Holocaust, there were people like the Madna family 
that were willing to do what is right even though they were living in a sea of evil. And I think that's a very important lesson. We are fortunate not to live in a sea of evil, but it is important for us whenever there is evil in the world, whether it's in the form of speech or action, I think it's important, just like the Madna family, to stand up and do what is right. Al, thank you very, very much.